Mais. After that, I got into uh, playing like hip hop and stuff in ninth grade because a lot of my friends, this would probably be about 84 then. So, you know, UTFO had just kicked in and Houdini and Run DMC and all of that. But for some reason, I was still one of those musicians. I was still more of a musician. I was really not into a lot of rap. It was like I really couldn't. I, I liked Run DMC because they had guitar. And I remember the first night I heard it's like that break on the radio it was it was like literally at late at night 2 30 in the morning and the next week the whole seemed like the whole city was playing the shit out that song but i heard it literally for the first time for anybody at 2 30 in the morning they kind of snuck it on to see like you know let's test this out and um you know it floored me and then um you know i, love, I had a lot of friends that i grew up with that were on that time too that were uh 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 well djing or getting in the turntablism like one of my buddies i grew up with uh his brother older brother was like a famous dj in detroit and um i remember when he would leave we would sneak and go uh in the basement and um and make little mixtapes and we would try to put everything like put the record like well, you got to put it no he didn't have it like that the record was facing that way you know what i'm saying <laughs> we try to put everything back exactly like he had it because his brother we know he we he was known to probably flip out on us if he knew we were sneaking making mixtapes on his equipment but uh we did it i think my first couple records of me djing in 81 actually was uh djing some craft work and um a lot of, you know, electronic stuff. A lot of the, you know, early Tommy Boy stuff was kicking in around then. But it, it also influenced my drumming. Um, you know, Art of Noise as well. Like, I was really into that that whole thing. And then um, fast forward into about uh, 1985, I think I established myself as a professional drummer at 15, um, I was doing my first recording sessions in a real studio, um, Pack 3, which if you know, uh, if you looked on some of the uh, P-Funk records, uh, Pack 3 was used uh, to record. Um, well, I know a lot of the Fuzzy Haskins records were recorded at Pack 3 and um, a few other ones. I know David Lee Spratly did a lot of work and engineer work out of Pack 3 as well. Um, and I ended up working with a gospel artist. Uh, he was very popular, Eric McAfee. We had a band, which was called The Second Coming. And uh, we was we was kicking ass. We was real known around town. We played all the talent shows. It was just a three-piece. He played keyboards and sang. And he could sing his ass off. I remember my grandmother, she didn't like a lot of the noise I made in the basement. But when he came over and sang, she was cool with that. Because, I mean, this kid can sound like Luther Vandross or Prince. Like, who do you know got range like that? And he's a kid, like literally 15, 16. So I started surrounding myself and getting to know these uh, these child prodigies I was growing up with in my neighborhood through uh, public school and school. And I had another band at the time. We were like Prince clones. Like, literally, cause I know you into some Prince. So you, I remember meeting Bobby Z and, and, and Brown Mark and telling them, hey, I was emulating you guys when I was in 15. Like, literally, we could play Prince songs in my first band, just like the record, at 14 and 15. That's how we studied it. So we were doing little talent shows uh, around the high schools, you know. And I remember my one singer, oh, my God, at his high school, uh, he had the lace on his eye, the whole thing, and the band was kicking. I think Pop Life had just came out, and we was, we was kicking that shit, you know, like, 
the uh, uh, planet. I mean, everything. I, you know, man, he got walked out to the mic, and this was his high school, so we were just guests, and I guess he arranged it. And uh, he had on his leather jacket. I'll never forget this as long as I live. And his little, little tight leather jacket and some pants. And and uh, he had a cherry curl and this lace thing going across his face. Before he could sing the first note, he comes out and the microphone falls in the damn audience. People started booing. And, and while, meanwhile, the, you, know, you know, they all hype. We killing it. And we all look at each other like, oh, my God, did you see that? Did you see that? Oh, man. So it was like the, the nightmare. He, I, I don't remember how what happened afterwards. I think he went out in the mic and tried to play it off and grab it. And, man, what a nightmare. But uh, the band was killing. So I remember coming back to my house, and we all kind of like, it was bad. We kind of like wore him out pretty bad about it. And like, man, I remember somebody screaming, in the audience, uh, Michael Jackson, you ain't Prince, because he had the Jerry here. He looked like Michael Jackson, actually, a little bit, but he was trying to do Prince. So that was like, and we all spoofed him about that for so long, like, Michael Jackson, you ain't Prince. And he also was another guy I went to uh, junior high school with that became a band member, which was weird. But, um, you know, I don't know. But uh, anyway, um yeah, there was a few. <laughs> but, so, um, my bass player, well, we had a bass player in the second coming, but for some reason, I don't know what happened. He ended up flaking, and we were doing all these recording sessions at Pack 3 uh, This is going to really trip you out. Guess who the producer was? Well, you know Chico Hamilton, the famous jazz drummer, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was Bernie Hamilton, his brother from Starsky and Hutch, like Captain Doby, the one of yelling, cussing at me, get out of here, you know what I'm saying? That dude was so fucking intense. That's when I was like, I knew producers were like, you know, well, you know, not every, all of them was like Phil Spectres, but this dude was pretty, <laughs> he was out there, you know, and uh, I remember him standing over me like, you gotta hear me some, you know, just doing, he like did some motion and turned into like the Tasmanian devil or some shit. <laughs> I'm looking at him like, what? <laughs> you know, like, I don't know what that is. He's like, you gotta give me some more, you know. <clears throat> anyway, um, <laughs> and that was like a gospel record we were recording. <laughs> and, um, uh, yeah, so at that time, it was pretty intense. And um, our band, we ended up being the house session, I guess, for the gospel records. But we cut our own stuff. Which was like it's kind of princess. I remember, um, I remember my drumming in Pack Three, and I don't, I don't can't remember if I was playing the click track yet or not. But I do remember it was pretty accurate, and um, we had this one song called Artificial Intercourse, and uh, I remember the beat. It was one of those really fast kind of up tempo like. You know, Minneapolis kind of grooves to it. And uh, it was a badass song. And then um, Bernie Mendelssohn, who was a name I know you know from early Funkadelic records. If you didn't know, here's a little history for you. When you hear the beginning of Standing on the Verge of Getting It On, and that weird-ass monologue in the middle before Red Hot Mama with George saying some shit and screaming and somebody screaming like, ah, you, you know that's Bernie Mendelssohn. So, <laughs> so uh, his name is in a few liner notes of Funkadelic album. But Bernie was at this session, actually. And he had been listening, I guess, in the background. I guess somehow he was friends with Bernie Hamilton. They were somehow in cahoots with something, uh, Westbound or something. I don't know. But um, I just remember me coming in, in the booth after I laid some of the tracks in. Bernie, and I didn't really know who he was till later, because he was like a really big dude. And he, I remember him being like, yeah, you sound pretty good, young guy. You, you sound like, you remind me of Cheeky Fullwood. And I looked like, wow, like I didn't know, you know, and um, you know, I you know, I know Tiki was a big in-demand session drummer. 
So a couple months later, I ended up getting uh, my boy on bass, which my boy was like a music prodigy. This guy, we both got scholarships to Berkeley, but neither of us went out of my high school. Um, and David Johnson, who uh, he ended up being, which he still is maybe, I think he's the music musical director for the Neville Brothers. Um, but Dave is a badass. I mean, he was doing like Victor Wooten stuff back in 85 with anybody. I mean, literally this dude one night we're on the gig and he took a drumstick and was just like, like, and on a, probably a $30 bass, you know, and, uh, he, you know, he was one of those diehards, real guys that, you know, boil his strings, you know, all that shit. But, um, he was into a lot of fusion, you know, uh, and, I grew up with it like my uncle, the one I was telling you about, who was a hippie that turned me on to Funkadelic. You know, he had a lot of the uh, Bitches Brew and Miles and all those albums too. But all that stuff kind of was over my head. A lot of my older aunts and uncles, they listened to like jazz. And I didn't really like a lot of jazz or I don't think I, I don't think I appreciated blues or jazz until I actually had to play it. And then I had a whole new respect for it. You know what I'm saying? So... Um, yeah, like my aunt, the one I was telling you about, she sat in with Enemy Squad earlier on when I first started the band, and I remember telling her, yeah, you got to get that shuffle going, and she sat in with the band a couple times, and they dug my aunt. She was funny. She was like probably 67, 70 years old, still jumping on my drums, jamming and shit, and my band was like, damn, your auntie, she badass and shit, and she had heard me play. She never seen me play in years since I was like, like, she never seen me play, really. She just heard me making noise. And if she saw me play for the first time, it blew her mind. I remember her just being like, I don't know anybody can do that. <laughs> Whatever you just did. And, and you know, I'm a, I'm ambidextrous as well. So um, I can play left-handed or right-handed, which is kind of weird. A lot of people, you know, can't really do that. But um, I used to practice setting my drum set left-handed. And uh, I think around that time, I got into a lot of, um, from playing with Dave, the guy I was just mentioning, um, we actually had a fusion band at, I, I have some recordings and, uh, it blows a lot of my friends. I was probably the least one with the skills because I was trying at that point, you know, the whole Prince thing kicked in electronic revolution. I had the Simmons and all that shit, but I just kept it traditional. Like, um, I was into a lot of, uh, uh, Bill Bruford, you know, and shit like that, and Earthworks and weird stuff, you know. I, I remember, I just got really weird around the 80s. Like, I was listening to a lot of strange-ass shit. I don't even think I listened to... I listened to P-Funk. I remember to some of my best George friends, but I remember at that point, I got into, like, punk rock and, um, like, weird-ass, just all kind of stuff, you know, like uh, ABC and... Squiddy Politi and groups like that. Well, Reef Martin, he ended up being uh, one of my favorite producers as well, who inspired me, and uh, probably Niles Rogers as well, around as far as, I probably got five or six favorite producers. I know they're in the two, and Rick Rubin is probably another one, and George is in there, and ran probably Prince. But, um, so anyway, um, you know, I got... When I got Dave into the band in Second Coming, we started taking over a lot of the gigs around Detroit. Um, a lot of these guys had four bands, you know, horns and whatever, but we was coming with a full assault with a, a power trio, just keyboard, drums, and bass. And uh, we were getting all the gigs, and it was pissing a lot of older guys off, you know, like because we was uh, featured. Now, here I am in high school. I probably was like 10th or 11th grade. I was working at a nightclub at night um, on Thursday nights and Sunday nights. Now, both of those are school nights because I had to be at school Fridays and Monday mornings. And needless to say, some of the mornings, I I couldn't even make it. We'd be up. And then you get out of a gig 2 or 3 in the morning, you know, and all. Uh, you know, if you break down and then we would, we would go eat a lot and just go to Denny's or somewhere and eat and talk shit, you know, and then until we got tired and maybe go home and jam or listen to music and, and then I would fall asleep 
And then uh, there wasn't there wasn't no way I was getting up and going to school. If I did, I would go to school probably my third or second hour. And um, I went to Mumford High School, which is a pretty famous high school for musicians, actually. Uh, Earl Clue went to my high school. Uh, Jimmy and Jerome Ali, uh, Tony Green, um, countless like you know badass musicians went to Mumford. The, the Winans family, uh, Steve Boyd, you know. Uh, you know, I can name names for days, but, uh, Randy Jacobs. So, um, I remember, uh, knowing Dave, but Dave was already in the high school band at, uh, Mumford. And, um, even though we were still doing those little night gigs, um, the stage band needed a drummer. Uh, one of the best drummers that they had went on a grambling and ended up going away to school. So um, I remember kind of, it was like an audition almost. I remember going to see the band in high school. I probably was in 10th grade then. And seeing them in the auditorium, the jazz band in high school. And seeing them play. And... Uh, they saw it. It was, you know, it's like most high school jazz bands. A little rusty, but you know, it's a high school jazz band. What can you expect? So, um, and they told me the my Dave was trying to instruct some of them, and Dave was like, "Man, why don't you play something?" And uh, I just remember uh, getting on the drums, and because me and Dave already played together, we automatically had a you know, a lock, which, you know, that bass player and drummer thing, that was always important to me. Um, and we, uh, we ended up, um, jamming something. I can't remember. It might have been, uh, Fire Shaker by Maynard Ferguson, which is like a, you know, funk track. It's funky, but it's jazzy. And, um, now, long story short, the, 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 you know, uh, the band, uh, uh, administrator over the, the, you know, everybody and the band director, he heard me and he was, he was impressed. And, um, he knew if Dave brought me to the fold, he already knew. And, uh, they ended up putting me in the, in the jazz band in high school. And, um, I went right in immediately and I couldn't read or anything. And, um. I remember him saying, you know, your ear is like amazing. And to this day, even when I go to jam sessions and play here in Detroit, like I can play with some of the best musicians. And speaking of like that Detroit Rogers record, for instance, with uh, people like Karen Brantley on there, who's worked with everybody and their mama. So those sessions that we did were all one, two, three, go. We didn't rehearse any of that stuff everything you heard that we did on that record was completely made up on the spot. And that comes from playing with seasoned musicians who you have chemistry with, you know, like I could tell, I used to tell everybody, you know, I've been a band leader for 30, still going on there, 30 years now. And I've worked with some of everybody and then some, you know, I'm liked by some people and not liked by other people, but I learned being a band leader earlier on, um, uh, that um you know you're not liked because you have to make some decisions that mm -hmm. sometimes people yeah. Yeah. oh yeah <laughs> yeah you have to make some decisions that people aren't are quite uh happy with yeah i love the artwork that dope i you know i take my hat off to him he took it and made it something because those sessions we just was free forming and he didn't give us any direction and um like I said, it would just magically happen. You know, Danny's sessions were different. I told Danny yesterday, you know, I love what what he did, and he loves what we did, which I didn't know he was going to be even on the record, and I'm sure he didn't know our outcome. But, um, but yeah, so getting back to the high school thing, um, jazz band was pretty deep because I learned um, dynamics and, and – how to play jazz, which I had, you know, I was kind of afraid at first because I'm like, oh, man, I got It's like, you know, I've been playing funk most of from all the way up to, you know, from 1980 to high school. So for seven years, I, I knew all this funk stuff. But 
um, the Jazz opened me up. I mean, because we ended up playing stuff like Spain and, um, you know, just all these different. I can't remember a lot of them now, but just so many different, like, you know, all blues, just all these different uh, compositions. And all the while, I faked reading the chart. And, you know, the the band leader knew I, I couldn't read, you know, but um, it was what it was. So, <laughs> but, um, so moving fast forward. So this had to be around 1987. Uh, at some point, I ended up hooking up with another one of my childhood friends who uh, introduced me to this clothes designer who was good friends with uh, Amp Fiddler. And um, Amp used to make a lot of his clothes and stuff. Well, I'm sorry. He used to make a lot of Amp's clothes. Let me get that right. And Amp was a model and would uh, you know wear a lot of his stuff and I remember um, meeting Amp, and yeah, this is '87. I remember. Well, damn, I don't want to. I remember meeting Amp. It's a part I don't want to skip to, but it's some crucial parts. I'm gonna get back to you. Meeting Amp, and he just did the theme music, which a lot of people don't know, to the Tracy Ullman show, and the track is just him and Bootsy. Bootsy is playing guitar and Amp is playing all the keyboards. And it's it's just such a this is the first first uh if she had another song with George later, you probably remember the other one. Like everybody's time that goes all crazy and shit. But this was her first theme song on the show and it was oh man, it was so dark and funky and nasty and the shit only lasts for like, you know, because it's a, a show intro. So it only lasted for like Shit, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds, if that, or 45 seconds. And I just remember loving that shit so much, I just made copies of it and and kept duping it over and over so it would be longer and extended it because it was just such a badass groove, right? It's, and Boosie is just killing it on rhythm. A lot of people don't know. He, you know, he's badass on rhythm and, you know, several instruments, and drums, and aside from him playing bass, you know, because that rhythm thing, you know, and, um, and the amps playing all these dark Bernie chords, you know, and I didn't really, you know, it was my first time meeting Amp, and I knew him from Was Not Was and, and other groups he was playing with. And um, so anyway, me and Amp established this relationship, so I'll put that on pause. Now, going back to, see, it's like I live, you know, I had to break these things up because, you know, I got like, you got Gabe Gonzalez, but you also got Godzilla. So... I had to break these things up because it's like I'm talking about two different lives of mine because they are separate. My music and my music DJ and thing, it's two, two different worlds. So I was a music collector around that same time. And I remember calling Pedro Bell on the back of the album cover. There was a number, uh, 312-874-DRAW. I still remember it. Like, And would you believe that was his mother's home number? <laughs> he put that shit on the covers. And... So it was almost like, it was like a secret. It's like, okay, if you really want to get in, in into the funk and you think you all about it, call this number. And I'm sure a lot of people did or didn't, but those who did, they realized it was a blessing and a secret behind it. And I remember this little lady answering the phone, like, oh, wait, hold on. It's like, uh, I, uh, is Pedro there? You know what I'm saying? She's like, uh, he's busy right now. Who's calling? <laughs> and I'm like, um, this is just a fan of his. Tell him I'll call back. I think I hung up because I was like, damn, okay. I got that far and I'm like, it really is his number. But it was strange. This little old lady was answering. So that flipped me out, right? So I don't think I, I hesitated to call back after a while. So, you know, a couple of days maybe go by. Was, was that number on one of George's covers? Some of my best Joseph friends. He also put it on Jimmy Jean the Tack Heads. So he put it on both two albums. Yeah, it was both those, Jimmy Jean the Tack Heads and some of my best Joseph friends. He didn't put it on, um, what was the other one, uh, the, the pop one after that with uh, Do Fires Go In My Shake or whatever. I can't think of it right now. I used to remember all that shit, man. I just. <laughs> I said the, the one after that was Army Skeletons in the closet. Oh, yeah, that's what I was talking about. Right, 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 right. 
Well, that was another thing. I, uh, sometime around 81 and all that, when I was telling you about me still being into the music, I got to meet Bootsy and, uh, the time and Sweatman at a, a record store, um, meet and greet. And I remember Bootsy giving me the number to Thang Incorporated because he knew I was so deep in the funk and I'm like this little kid, you know, Bootsy seemed like he was 20 feet tall back then. And he had the braids and the ultra wave. Thing. And uh, he was, he, you know, kids always was attracted to Bootsy more than George because, you know, he had that thing about him that was user friendly like a Muppet or something, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, and it was cool. And like, I just remember bugging Thang Incorporated every day. Like, I would call them, and I still remember that number. It was like 2592022 or something. And um, that kind of opened me up again to uh, P Funk because, um, I was, um, my first P-Funk concert was Glory Hollow Stupid, which was, uh, 80. And they landed the egg and all that, which was, uh, you know, was pretty deep. And, uh, I was shocked that I got to meet George. Uh, my dad took me and, uh, you know, it was like that mean Joe Green thing. I'm like, all right, dad, you know, George Clinton, come on, prove it. I'm pulling on this, just his uh, arm sleeve, you know. And sure enough, my dad made him pull some strings and we didn't have passes, but he knew people and he whatever he did, we got backstage. And I remember meeting George and uh and my first my dad was like but he he went off somewhere and I was with some people that was with us or something standing there first and then he came back and then we got access to go backstage. It was Joe Louis Arena. Which people, uh, a fact that people should know, P Funk was the first black act to play Joe Louis Arena when it was just built here in Detroit. And uh, I remember that show vividly. It was the Brides of Funkenstein open, the Barcades was on it, and then P Funk. And um, now, to mind you, this is my first, first concert. I'm like 10 or 11. Shit blew me away, man. I was just like, <laughs> I was blown away. And this is another part that's deep. Parliament and Funkadelic were both my favorite groups coming up. But I didn't know that they were the same people uh, until I went to that concert. Because I remember the Brides playing Super Stupid that night in their set, believe it or not. And Blackbird was playing with them. I'm not sure if Dennis was playing, probably so, but... Uh, at that time, I wasn't even into watching drummers or knowing who they were. I was just so still mesmerized by the whole front line of the P-Funk shit, you know, with the characters and people. I wasn't looking at that, at that, that shit. So I just remember this lady took a joint out of her purse about that long, and I had never seen nothing like that. And I was just like looking, and I was like, whoa. And we were in, way up in the top at first, and then we ended up walking down somehow on the main main floor getting closer and I just remember uh, I can't remember a lot of it I just remember being there I do remember backstage and meeting the George part though I remember that vividly and um, so we get backstage and uh, first person I met was Bernie and Bernie had these pants that, that were had hair growing out of them when they were some hairy ass pants and I just remember looking at his pants like, like whoa you know and he was another one that was uh, the kids loved, and he was very user friendly with kids, you know. Um, so we got back, and I just remember just smelling. All of a sudden, the closer we got to the backstage, just smelling this pungent, strong weed smell. And um, and it's also deep. I want to mention my family tried to stop me from going to this show previously because they were concerned because they knew it was going to be, you know. We smoking and whatever else because it's P Funk. So my aunts and uh, like literally my whole family had a meeting about this shit, and I thought I wasn't gonna get to go, and um, it ended up being cool because I had a, a older cousin who was a he was a a hell of a sergeant or uh, high ranking police on the gang squad in Detroit, who also happened to be a P Funk fan. 
Uh, I was remember listening to him, listening to Mothership Connection in his little room in the air, lighting incense, and don't uh, you know? I don't know what he was doing, but I just remember my uncles and a lot of my aunts and uncles loved P Funk, and they were just cool and play it, you know, and try to hide it from me. But hey, I I hear you in there, no, you know what I'm saying? But uh, he okayed it, and we, he was kind of the one like if anybody had say so over my aunts and other cousins who was like all like, oh, we don't know about you. He was like, oh, that's all right. He just going to see the mothership land tonight. He'd be all right. He let me go. Because I guess my stepdad was like, he got to go to this concert or it's going to kill him. You know what I'm saying? And I was determined because I had missed the other ones uh, previous year. Like, I missed the, the 78 tour and the 79 Detroit Cobo Hall show because I was really too young and or whatever. Nobody wanted to take me or whatever happened. It just didn't happen. And then you know, I remember the commercials and everything. But uh, anyway, so... We get backstage, and George's about 10 feet from my, my old man. And I remember George had the braids in his hair and extensions and stuff. And I remember him yelling out, hey, that's the, that's the dude who cut my hair, da 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 whatever. And I'm looking like, oh, shit. You know, like, you know, like I'm all like, wow, he really does know my father. And I don't know if my dad staged that, but probably not. But like I said, we were at least 10 feet from George walking up on him and I just remember being like so excited and then so now we ended up in George's dressing room and uh I was like I was in heaven I was just looking around and my father's like yeah this is my son man he he reads on knows about all y'all shit and reads them album covers he 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 a funkadelic himself and George and everybody laughed right now here I am 10 11 years old and it was my dad telling this to George so George looks at me in amazement and uh, I remember we had them Uncle Jam platforms on, but he had some red ones that had the star on the toe. They weren't white. They were red. And he had, I think, maybe his, uh, you know, army uh, coat or something. And uh, he pointed everybody out in the room. He's like, who was that? Who was that? And I named everybody, like, right off. And it blew his mind. He was just like, damn. He, I know he's thinking these kids really are reading these album covers. Now, I, like I was again, you know, shy of eleven, maybe ten, and um, it, it floored him. And then uh, I remember I had a big ass giant boombox sitting there, <clears throat> and uh, I remember Clip came in the room. I was scared of Clip because Clip had this really long tail coming out of his fucking head and shit. And I didn't know Clip. I didn't know nothing about him. I didn't know like. You know, my era of P-Funk, I was all from 77 back. But, you know, all these newer people, I really didn't know. But Gary was there. I was also scared of Gary because Gary was just sitting there looking. And he didn't say much, but he was just looking. And uh, I just remember being afraid of him because I was just like <laughs> – But um, he had that white hat on, his long, white, famous hat. But that's how I knew it was him. I was like, Gary Scheider and so-and-so. And I just remember naming all these people when uh, – and, and and George is flooring by that. So as we were in the dressing room, he pops a tape in in, in the deck, and something comes on. And I know he put it on for me because he he well, he wanted to see my response almost. And it's like I guess the first origins of electric spanking. I guess it was that crazy ass monologue with Junie at the beginning and, and Shirley Hayden with the alien thing. It was just something crazy. I just remember being like, what? wow, what is that? You know, I'm listening. I'm all in, you know, and uh, and I hear a little bit of it. And uh, I think we ended up having to leave or something. And um, I get his autograph and um, somebody found some paper and something in drawers. I remember he put Let's Go Wiggle with those little backwards Dr. Funkenstein eyes and he drew his signature on it. And, uh, and we were there, and uh, and we left. And I remember um, before we left, George gave me five. He's like, "Yeah, little man, you know, you're a funketeer. You you did, you know." And I looked at him. I was like, "Yeah," I said, "Fly on," and did like that. And the look on his face, it just fucked up. He wasn't expecting that because he didn't know I knew. I went back on his ass. Like, this had to be, you know, I went back to 70, and this had to be 1980. 
And when I said that, he wanted like, you know, he was he his, his eyes just got really big and you know what I'm saying? And uh it ended up being a trip. But uh you know Do you still have that uh, autograph? Do you still have that autograph? Man, you know that autograph, uh when I was in military school, I took it to show it off and one of the nuns tore it up. <laughs> I was, man, I wanted to kill her. I ain't going to even lie. I was, like, so pissed the fuck off. And I remember just looking at it in the garbage in pieces and wanted to just get it out. And I seen her behind me, like, yeah, you get it out. I dare you. And I just remember walking away and tears started streaming down my face. Like, and I, I would determine, like, maybe, like, maybe I'll sneak back down here in the middle of the night. And it was, man, like, literally my autograph with George Clinton was in the garbage. And all the kids felt bad for me, too, because they – Cause I had all the older kids. They, they, everybody knew about George, especially the older kids. They were like, they were in awe of that. So it almost gave me a, a pass and credibility with a lot of the older kids. In the military school, that you know, they're like, oh, he's cool, man. He's cool, you know. You know, he met George Clinton, la da da. Cause they were in all in the kiss and everything at that school and the nuns and stuff. One time, they threw all of our kiss in Parliament in a big drum in the back of the school and burned it. I'll never forget that either. So <laughs> a lot of records went to waste there. But no, nah, so fast forward it, um, so I called that number, and um, uh, um, and again, and I finally started talking to Pedro, and it was Pedro, and Pedro had his own language. If you didn't never talk to him or know, like, literally, he had his own, like, all that shit he was saying, he really meant that shit. That wasn't just some shit he was writing. That's how he talked, like, for real. Like, he's like, uh, he's like, dang, I ain't got no crinkly today. These Molly Fockers, you know, like Molly Fockers, that's how he would say, you know, motherfucker, his way of saying it. But it was just deep, you know. And uh, we became close. Um, he ended up schooling me real quick, like, you know, because he knew how deep I was. I'm like, man, I got all you guys albums. I play, I met George and I just shit, you know, my dad did his. So he was he was intrigued because I'm sure most of the people who called him were a lot older or already you know adult P Funk fans. So at that time, I think I was probably 15 or 16, and uh, he was pretty floored by that. And on another note, he's the one who got me uh, into the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Uh, I remember him telling me well, certain albums at that time he was telling me to get. Um. Uh, so a lot of his influence, a lot of my musical influence during that time was through Pedro. Um, groups like um, Tackhead and not P Funk's Tackhead, Doug Wimbish and Keith LeBlanc and all that shit. I was heavily into them, like big time. And you know they were almost like another P Funk. And uh, anyway, like I said, the Chili Peppers, and he loved the Chili Peppers so motherfucking much. He was like, and you know, and I can say it now. And there, you know, it wasn't never no Sam and Pedro's game. He flat out said the Red Hot Chili Peppers Freaky Style album was better than every Capitol Clinton, every record that George put out on Capitol. Now, nah, that was such a profound statement. I'm thinking, what? Really? He was like, yeah. He's like, that's what Funkadelic would be or should be at this point. And uh, so I went out and found it and bought it. And, uh... And some stuff on there was all right. It wasn't, I mean, because I like some of the Capitol stuff. So, but I, I, I could get where he was coming from. And I ended up being uh, uh, so into the Chili Peppers that, uh, like, I knew all their songs. And, uh, like, literally, and Jack Irons, to me, was, like, one of my biggest influences. Now, this is, like, I'm still in high school then. It's probably 87. So now I'm like going to school wearing these red hot chili peppers t shirts and my hair is cut all crazy and mohawks and shit and I'm still in jazz band and everybody's looking like, What the hell? You know, like I was like almost an automatic transformation after I talked to Pedro. I was just turned into like a straight up funk funk refugee and shit. And uh you know, he just turned me on to a lot. He also turned me on to uh P Funk collector Lee Rosenblum, who's uh, been a good friend of mine for years, and uh, one of P Funk's main main collectors for years. Uh, in George's eyes, I mean, George gave him a lot of stuff to hold on to because he knew he would archive it and keep it. And um, 
He's had so much stuff. He's just now, he just found some pictures the other day. I'm sure you saw me post them on the WPFR page, but uh, uh, him and Boosie, uh, and him meeting George for the first time. But um, but Lee, um, Pedro told me to get in touch with him and find him uh, to get stuff that, uh, um, like, I didn't know about P-Funk's Osmium album. I didn't know that existed because it, ne- it was never in their discography when they showed the albums. And Let's Take It to the Stage was also an album that I never, I thought didn't exist. I thought it was just a title they just threw in there. Like, what is, I, I was baffled by it. I was the only Funkadelic album I didn't have for years. And I ended up getting it uh, in 86. My buddy Dave Johnson, who I told you about, he snuck it in on me because he would just give me different albums. And, and I remember seeing that cover with the Linda Blair, and I was, he, I was jumping up and down like, dude, it does exist. And he didn't, like, I was freaking the hell out in his bedroom. And he didn't, he's like, oh, man, that's my brother's record, man. He don't play that shit no more. You can take it. I'm like, what? And. Oh man, I, I ran home as fast as I could, and um, I studied that one because it was like uh, it was shocking for me, you know. And then and then uh, getting into it, and then uh, that's when Pedro was telling me, like I said, this is around '86 again. He said, "Any rare P Funk records you find or see, buy them all up. They're gonna be mega collectors' items one day." He's like, already people from Japan are coming over buying up all the P-Funk stuff in truckloads right now. And this is 85, 86, he's telling me this stuff. So I'm thinking, what? So I started, uh, if you remember Goldmine Magazine mm-hmm. back in the, in the day, that had, you know, all kind of rare, it was for rare music collector dudes and stuff. I started buying it and reading it and, and um, meeting some of the hardcore P-Funk fans in the, in the back of the magazine and with their little ads in the corner, like, oh, Live P Funk shows and not at uh and I ended up meeting one of the guys and uh trading some stuff. I think he ended up giving me uh Rocky Mountain Shakedown, which was uh P Funk Live in Colorado seventy six. And they opened for Santana. A lot of people didn't know that. But I knew all that back then. I had that back then before YouTube. I had that recording. That had to be like 87, 88, and um, I got hard core into it, and when I graduated high school, finally, um, and I was on tour, well, again, the music, my musical career then kicked back in, even though I was still collecting music and stuff, um, from working with some of those gospel artists, I ended up working with um, Jay Moss, uh and who's a famous gospel artist i don't know if you heard of him he's like the he's, he's a popular guy he's like he's he's like big in the gospel world um and in the younger days his brother his older brother bill moss they were like a a duet and uh because jay moss had a he had a almost michael jackson falsetto and then he started hitting puberty and then his voice changed you know but we would do a lot of gigs and stuff. And their father is the, the legendary Bill Moss, who was signed to Westbound Records, Bill Moss and the Celestials. And um, they are also, uh, their grandmother was Maddie Moss Clark, if you don't know who she was. Like Dr. Maddie Moss, she was well known in the gospel world. And. Uh, uh, she didn't like me too well. Uh, that's another story. Something happened one day <laughs> in a church service. And long story short, I remember seeing something fly past my head because I couldn't remember a, a Bible verse. And uh, I guess she threw a Bible at me or something. And it, it blew my mind, like literally in this rehearsal, in this service with everybody. And I was just like, did she really just do that? And I think from that day on, um, I didn't play any more gospel music, but uh, it was crazy, you know, but uh, I really, uh, you know, got heavily into it because it, it got my chops because gospel drumming, I mean, that shit is no joke. And actually, the era when I was doing gospel drumming, it wasn't what they're doing now because what they're doing now is basically funk with gospel lyrics over it. When I was playing gospel, 
it was like punk rock almost because it was sanctified and fast. And tattoo, you know, people be losing, getting the Holy Ghost. It was like literally fast, like super fast punk rock. And tat, and tat, you know, we was like, that's the kind of gospel I played. So, so here I was on Sundays playing with these sanctified gospel groups and churches around the city. Uh, one of my, uh, another instructor who took me under his wing and we became real close and he, he kind of hooked me up with some of those gospel gigs. A uh, drummer by the name of Andre Hawkins, rest in peace. And uh, Andre was, he was a drummer's drummer. Uh, if he was, you know, he ended up getting killed, unfortunately, or, well, at least that's what I'm going to say. They, the news said something otherwise, but uh, I was his protege. Um, he took me under his wing. So he saw me play at a, one of those high school talent shows I was telling you about. And I think that gospel group that I ended up playing with was on the same uh, show as my group, The Second Coming. And uh, I remember having, like, I was always wearing masks and stuff. And I wore one of those crazy um, drama masks, like Prince had hanging in his room, you know. The, I had one of those on, a ceramic one. And I remember hanging from my face. And I remember playing the drum so hard that the shit fell off and crashed and shattered in all these pieces on this challenge show, right? We're killing it. And like everybody was blown away by, by me and like my boy. I mean, for a, for a power trio, I'm telling you, we was a force to be reckoned with. But um, so anyway, uh, somehow we ended up getting off into uh, my buddy Dave, who I mentioned with the fusion thing. And I started listening to more uh, uh, Lenny White and Billy Cobham. I was always into Lenny White since the 70s from the funk stuff, but I didn't really know a lot about his fusion stuff. And um, I really got heavily into, you know, a lot of that. Harvey Mason. Um, uh, even, um, uh, man, what's my man? I forget his name right now. He was on uh, Stanley Clark's Rock pebbles and sand when he was 16 the drummer simon phillips mm -hmm. so uh you know i was influenced by a lot of these these cats coming up and um andre uh he made a demo in my basement for john lupante he was about to audition for john lupante and at the time i had a four track recorder and um, I was, you know, doing little sessions for my friends and, and uh, some of the guys at P-Funk would come over. And Andre, uh, we did a demo, literally. I recorded his drums and mic'd them up. He brought his kid in the basement and I set it up for him. And <clears throat> he did like three or four different solos. And, and um, I remember recording them all on three or four tracks. And, um, and we mixed it down and uh, he sent it off. I don't know if he, I think he almost might have gotten it or something like that. They might have called him back, but at the time, he had already uh, passed away. And uh, it's pretty, like I said, tragic because, uh, man, this dude, he was a badass on drums. I remember one of his tricks, like he would do like this double bass thing. And while he was doing double bass, he would do this little genie dance while he was doing double bass. So it's pretty like he was a show drummer, you know. He wasn't, and he was real humble and quiet and was always smiling. Like, Andre was the type of guy, you see him think that he would never have a bad day. He was a really short guy, too. He's a tiny but powerful drummer, super powerful, and um, real nice. And I was like, I never seen him. If you pissed Andre off, he was, you had to be a real asshole. You know what I'm saying? So, but it's like I said, but the reason I'm mentioning him, here's a drummer he talked about, um... Uh, which I knew about, but I really hadn't paid attention to. He was big in the Dennis Chambers. And uh, I didn't know a lot about Dennis. I do remember Dennis, and I brought it up when I was just with Dennis last time. Like, man, I remember you had an ad in Modern Drummer. A lot of people don't know Dennis was the spokesman for the double pedal that drummers play today. Like, he was the first to have that. And was Dennis reminded me um, that I guess that had been around for years, but people just discarded it and threw it away and he told me the story how he found it one one day upstairs in the uh 
up in Manny's in the back room or something, the, the slave pedal, and he took it in to some of those sessions he was doing with Sugar Hill and, um, you know, started uh, messing with that that uh, thing with the uh, slave pedal. And um, and then, like I said, I remember around 84, Modern Drummer had uh, an ad with him. It was a really tiny ad, but I still remember it. And it was saying Dennis Chambers, P-Funk, and da 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 and half the people in the book probably didn't know like Dennis Chambers was going to be on the cover for the next 10 years. You know what I'm saying? So... But I did. I knew, but I didn't really know, no. And then, um, like, Andre was all into it. He knew and was telling me all these different drummers around town that was friends with Dennis. And and he befriended me, and we just would hang. And um, I remember one day in high school, I left school early, and we caught the bus to go see a Billy Cobham clinic. And uh, I was 16 then, and I just remember uh, seeing Billy – playing to a drum machine and had all his fucking toms backwards. Like, you know, I was just looking like, what in the world? Now, you know, I, I, like I told you, I was always into crazy setups, but this one was like, and then a drum machine too. But during that time, you know, um, drum machine, as you know, was taking over the drum session industry. So a lot of drummers weren't getting a lot of work and drums weren't being used unless you programmed or, you know, was good at it. And then what the Fairlight was popular, who could afford that? What well, it started at what twenty five or fifty grand. So you know, if you knew a studio that had the Fairlight, you know what I mean. Uh, you know, it was something. But um, but no. So, but getting back to that eighty six thing. So around that time, uh, Pedro also told me to reach out to Michael Clip Payne, who was in Detroit at the time. And uh, he gave me Clip's number. And uh, that was a whole other deep story with me and Clip. Uh, you know, I owe Clip a lot, too. Um, you know, a lot of gratitude. Cause he uh, got me involved. Uh, you know, like I called the first time I called his house. It was deep. Uh, but I don't really go into that. But it was pretty deep. And um, I'm just blessed that we know each other. Because that could have been deep. Had I not called or maybe who knows. But um, he ended up talking to me, and I remember calling him for the first time, like, hey, man, I'm a fan of yours, and Pedro told me to call you, and I know all about, I think, By Way to Drum was out, but nobody knew about it. And I was like, yeah, I know all about By Way to Drum, you know, because I was all, and he was going through some kind of domestic situation at the moment I was on the phone. I didn't really realize, and I won't say too much. So he ended up calling me back. But, uh, yeah, that was deep. I ain't gonna, like I said, go into too many details. You, you know, if, if you want to edit this out, that's cool too. But I'm just, uh, just, just, just being real with my story about how I came encounter with Clip. And, um, I think it almost went like, uh, he, uh, anyway. So Clip ended up meeting me one day through a mutual friend of mine, a guitar player, uh, who ended up being in my band. And um, Clip, like, heard me play in my basement. And um, I was just jamming. And uh, a while after that, he ended up, um, he was with this group called Onyx, which was a, a, a well-known uh, Detroit group. Uh, they were really known uh, for reggae and rock. They mixed uh, reggae and rock, basically. And they had a, na a national hit that was getting played on the radio called Dreadwave. And um, the leader of the group was married to um, Satori, uh, Satori Sakura, who was... Uh, She's on Facebook. She's, uh, everybody knows her as that Jeanette Magruder, who was one of the brides. And um, I think Clip was involved. He did some a lot of work with them. And Blackbird as well did some session work and played on some stuff. And uh, they had another, it was like two groups, because uh, he had been around P-Funk for a while and was inspired by them. And... Uh, so he had two different bands. One was called Cherubim, which was a rock group, and the other one was called Onyx, which was, you know, like a black stone. And um, 
that ended up being deep. Uh, Clip ended up getting me in the band, and I ended up being a drummer, which by this time, I think I was about 19, I guess, 18, 18. And uh, I was still in high school. And uh, uh, we did, we played, we played a lot of live shows. And for me, it was good because, uh, like I told you, one of my first drum instructors uh, played reggae and was in the reggae. But I hadn't played reggae in years, so it kind of, I had to, I was a little rusty, but I got back into it. And I remember watching the, the rock school back in the 80s with, uh, Sly Dunbar on there showing you how to play reggae as well with the one drop. And, you know, that's important when you don't play that one drop. You know, the reggae dudes are serious about that, you know. So the one drop is, is everything, you know what I'm saying? In traditional reggae, you know, nowadays it's these little dance hall beats or whatever it is now. But back then, it's like traditional gospel and everything. They had their formula, you know. But uh, so... Uh, we ended up going to the studio and recording a record, uh, which had some P-Funk alumni on it. Um, and myself, I think I, I don't think I played the drums. I remember I could program. I was really good at programming drums. I learned from, from Clip and Amp how to program. So I was also doing a bit of programming as well as playing. But uh, we ended up cutting this record. It's, it's on YouTube, Shake Up Yourself, which is kind of like my first record or release, which is probably 89. And uh, I, I say it's pretty, uh, I'm pretty proud of it and honored because uh, it was my first production and uh, my first recording, which features a legendary trumpet player, uh, Marcus Belgrave, on it. So, uh, you know, that ended up being a pretty, uh, pretty good song. The group, uh, ended up disbanding a little couple years after that, but there's an interesting part. They ended up selling the name Onyx to Jam Master J for his rap group, Onyx. I was going to mention there was a rap group called that. Yeah. Exactly. So the well, they bought our name and, um, well, bought the name from him. And he was one of the ones that implemented the band leader thing. I mean, because at the time, I just wanted to play. I wasn't thinking about that. And we was having a lot of different uh, personnel changes. And, like, Clip was just becoming to become busy with uh, with George again because uh, George had just got his, his deal with Paisley Park at the time. And um, P-Funk slowly but surely started getting a few gigs here and there. Uh, they were mostly one-offs, you know, a lot, not a lot, but, um, and I remember meeting George back around that time, again, finally, uh, going to meet Amp one night later at the studio, and, uh, we talked, and I gained access, and I was really quiet, I was real shy around, I remember George always asking me, why are you so quiet? And I just remember being like, I don't know. But I, later, I thought to myself, like, thinking, shit, I don't know what to say around these dudes. I'm a sponge trying to, you know, like, I'm like the fly on the wall. Like, what the hell do I say? I mean, I'm around my idols. I was in awe. I mean, nothing, nothing, I, I didn't, I was really quiet, like, literally quiet, if you can believe that. Um. So, you know, I, I remember bringing up the story about, you know, my father cutting the moves to stars, and me and George chopped it up. And he's like, oh, yeah, so-and-so, yeah, man, I was in, you know, this, that, and the other. Uh, so, some point during the course of that, um, I think Why Should I Dog You Out came out, and uh, Prince wanted George to start doing some in-stores and more promotion, around cities like Detroit, which, you know, Prince had a big, uh, you know, uh, kick and fan base here who supported him and, and, and uh, George was about to get back on. So we did a show at this little club called a Cotton Club in Detroit, which I had a video of that. I, I wish I had lost it or it may have gotten stolen out of my house. But uh, anyway, it was technically my first gig with P-Funk, which was 1988. 
and I was still in high school. I was about 18. And um, Elijah was in the band, a few other people. Uh, Belita was like, she was fresh. Um, You know, just a lot of the locals that dealt with George. Ron Ford, I I remember, was there. Uh, Gary ended up showing up. Um, and I remember us rehearsing in my grandmother's basement. It was kind of like half of my enemy squad and half of Georgia's band, which is what, so it was deep, you know, why I've always been affiliated with P-Fun, whether people know that or not, why I feel I'm legitimately connected to that because one of my first shows with P-Fun, my band was half of his band and we backed George up a few times on you know, one-off shows here in Detroit. While he was still out with P-Funk, he would fly in and do stuff, and we would back him up as his band here. So, 